Perhaps one of the most fundamental questions in all of psychology is the role of the environment. Why are humans the way we are? Why are different humans different? What is essential in the environment to the making of human behavior and to human mind? And what are the malleable points during development in which even small changes in the environment can lead to very different outcomes? What are the mechanisms of change? The larger point that I want to make today is that to answer these questions, we're going to have to understand how environments themselves develop. So my colleague at Indiana, Randy Beer, illustrated the brain-body environment system with this little figure of boxes here. The brain is housed in the body, and the body is in the world. But the key point that Randy was trying to make is that what the brain does determines what the body does. And what the body does changes the environment by moving an eye, by turning a body, by lifting an object, by arguing with someone. We select and create the sensory input for learning and for development. And these changes that we make in the world come back to the brain through the body. My Olaf, Olaf Sporns like to, likes to say that the brain extends into the world, that the patterns of functional connectivity and structural connectivity make what we do in the moment, and then what we do in the moment and how that changes over developmental time is a product of the brain's own changes, feeds back in and changes the functional and even the structural connectivity of the brain. We need to understand this if we want to understand why we are the way we are. So what I want to do today is concentrate on how environments develop. Babies change dramatically in the course of development over what they can do and what they do do. And in so doing, they open and close gates on experience. We do not yet have a theory or a computational understanding of the implications of the ordered sequence of experiences that babies create for themselves. So today, what I really want to do, the sort of take-home lesson, is I want to make the case that we need to pursue the implications of how environments change over time. And, and the case that we need to understand, we need a theory of that change. I'm going to do this by concentrating on visual environments and with a special emphasis on their role in early object name learning. So here's the outline of the talk. I'm first going to talk about how sensory motor changes in the baby bring over developmental time an ordered set of lessons. It's not one big sea of data. Then I want to go into the next, to, to the more rapid time level, and look at how the real time, intrinsic dynamics of babies at different points in development drive change in learning. And that will lead me to thinking about developmental niches and how the intrinsic dynamics of the baby and the environments that that baby creates for themselves um, is different at different points in development in ways that foster the mastery of tasks. And I'll conclude with thinking about a pathways approach to development. So the data that I'm going to present is all going to come from our head camera studies. This is work um, been doing in collaboration with Chen Yu and um, Karen James and uh, Caitlin Fossey, among others. And what we are trying to, what this we're doing here is we're studying the visual world from the infant's own perspective. Egocentric vision is an emerging field, um, both in machine learning, in adult vision, and in infant vision. And it's a study, what, what we're trying to bring to it is how the study of um, visual environments change with the perceiver's own actions and locations. And we have now been working on this uh, for nearly a decade. 
The important point of why one wants to study the egocentric view, the view from the child's own momentary disposition in space, is that the personal view is highly selective. It depends on the person's, where they are at their moment, and their momentary bodily posture. So, for example, in this image here, in the room with that baby is a dog, a clock on the wall, a woman at the sink washing dishes, dad doing the laundry. But the baby is not seeing those things at that moment. What the baby is seeing is what's right in front of the baby. If there are principal differences with development in what's likely to be in front of babies' heads, then there are going to be principal differences in the visual experiences for development. Now, I want to do this really quickly. Um, we've done a lot of our work using um, head-mounted eye trackers as well as head cameras, but today I'm going to just talk about the data from the head cameras, or what's called the scene cameras. Um, some folks worry about that because you can worry about, well, you know, the head camera is recording what's in front of my head, but of course my eyes can go other places. And maybe what's right in front of my head is not what my eyes are looking at. But the fact of the matter is, is when you have people moving in a three-dimensional world, be they babies or be they adults, they tend to view the world with heads and eyes aligned. So I might glance over there, but if I'm going to really look over there, I will turn my head. And that turning of heads, that aligning, once we see something we want to look at in a 3D world, happens in about 500 milliseconds. So what I'm going to be doing in this work is telling you about the statistical regularities in large corpora of egocentric images. And mostly you can assume, as we've shown um, in our various studies, that gaze distribution for infants under a variety of different conditions and in different tasks tends to be in the center, roughly, of that head camera image. All right. So to get us started, let's look at what babies see. This is a four-month-old baby. And four-month-old babies can do a fair bit, but not much. And this baby sees a lot of what mom decides to show her. Okay. So that's one head camera image. Here's the next one. This is of a crawler, an 11-month-old crawler. What does that 11-month-old crawler see? You might be thinking about the dirt spots on the floor and the um, furniture legs, but really that baby is now driving new kinds of optic flow and motion information. And that when that comes on, when that movement starts and that new kind of information, that actually is driving very important changes in the visual system. Now we have this very same child. Nope, this is a 13-month-old walker. Okay. Um, as I always say when I show this film, they don't call them toddlers for nothing. Okay. So that was a 13-month-old walker. Now this next image is that very same child, that very same 13-month-old toddling walker with head stability issues as she walks. But here is that same child sitting, sitting and holding an object. And look at how remarkable those, that visual experience is, stabled, focused, sustained, of the kind that can invite a mature partner to come in and say something about the object. So that's the point, is that the order of development as shown in that graph is presenting different regularities at different points in time. And so that's what I want to talk about now, the changes on the larger time scale over developmental time. And what I'm going to do is present data from what we call the HomeView Project. And I actually want to call out the National Science Foundation here because it was very, very brave of them to support this. And I know it was brave because other people refused to. What we are trying to do here is build a corpus of developmentally indexed egocentric scenes. To date, we have 75 infants. They are in age from three weeks to 24 months. We ask each of the parents of these infants to try to collect for us six hours of head camera video. 
and to do so in the home. There are no experimenters present during any of this, and we try to get six hours because we don't want parents to do anything special. We have the cameras embedded on hats. They record on SD cards at 30 hertz, and to date we have over 54 million extracted images in the corpus. Now what we do in the studies that I'm going to talk about today is we sample from those, that corpus one image every five seconds, and this here shows you images from a six-week-old, 31-week-old, 53-week-old, and 102-week-old infant, and shows you um, in each little triplet images that are five seconds apart so that you can see the visual world at the scene level actually changes fairly slowly. Every five seconds and apart still presents a quite coherent view. All right. So what do babies see in these images? Well, one thing you might ask about is about faces. People are very interested in faces, and you might think that this is a constant property of human visual experiences since we are, after all, social animals and we live and grow in social worlds. But the interesting fact that we have discovered in, um, by analyzing these corpus is that the rate of faces in babies' visual worlds is not constant. So what this graph here is showing on the y-axis is the proportion of frames with faces. And on the x-axis is the age and month of individual infants. Each one of those dots is a single infant, and each infant is contributing about 3,000 um, frames. And what you can see is that the frequency of faces in these infants' head camera images declines actually pretty dramatically with age over the first year of life. Infants between um, under three months of age, since frames are a measure of time, those dots under three months of age means that those babies are seeing faces 15 minutes out of every hour, okay? Slightly over 15 minutes out of every hour. If you think of how many hours they're awake, that's a lot of faces, 15 minutes of every hour. By the time they're approaching their first birthday, the frequency of faces in these images is less than six minutes an hour. Okay? So over the first year, the frequency of faces, the density of faces, is running, declining from 15 minutes an hour to six minutes an hour. Moreover, what we see in um, these data is that the proportion of frequently appearing faces for the very youngest infants, those under three months, are predominantly the three most frequent, they, they belong to three people. So for babies under three months of age, you can account for 100% pretty much of all the faces they're seeing, close to 100%, by accounting for three people, mom, dad, and let's say grandma. By the time you're approaching uh, 12 months of age, the three most frequent individuals in your life are still the most frequent faces you see, but now other faces are coming in as well. But perhaps the most dramatic result we've got is the proximity of those faces. Not only are little babies seeing a lot of faces, 15 minutes out of every hour, but the faces that they are seeing are within two feet of them close, upright, both eyes in view, the canonical face. For older babies, those faces are often quite far away. Now, it is not the case that young babies under three months of age are seeing a lot of faces because there are more people near them, whereas people leave the room for older infants. If you look in these head camera images and you ask how many body parts of other people are in view, faces, hands, arms, knees, whatever, it's absolutely constant across the first two years of life. People are nearby. No sensible person would leave an 18-month-old alone. But it's not faces that are in view. Okay. Indeed, this figure shows the proportion of body frame, the proportion of frames that had a body in which that body part also included the face. 
as a function of age over the first two years of life. And as you can see, the decline is quite dramatic. Okay? So when a two-year-old is looking at somebody's body in the natural viewing, it's unlikely to be the face. But when a three-month-old, there's a body in the view, it's likely to be a face. What's in view for those older children? So what we show in this figure is on the upper little slide, we show what I've just told you about, which is the decline in the frequency of faces as a function of age. The next slide shows the frequency of hands in view as a function of age. So what's happening over the first two years of life is the frequency of faces is declining in their view, but the frequency of hands is increasing. The image, the larger image, just shows for each infant the difference between the frequency of faces and the frequency of hands. And there is a systematic shift from what body part is predominantly in view with age. Now, the hands that are in view for these infants, they are not just hanging by the body doing nothing, okay? They are holding on to objects. So this shift from faces to hands is not strictly about a shift from faces to hands. It's about a shift from a visual world that's filled with faces to a visual world that's about instrumental acts on objects. Because what hands do is do things with objects. I think that these differences in the visual environment are potentially of profound importance for understanding how we achieve all that we achieve in visual object recognition. What we've done in this slide here is we've tried to say if we took all the babies we've tested up to a year and we assumed it was one child and we just extracted what would be the frequency of faces in their visual, in their views in terms of the cumulative number of waking hours they've had to that point. And what you could see is that for young babies, a lot in their cumulative visual experiences, faces are a major input. But for older babies, the visual world is made up of other stuff. The cumulative experience now of faces levels off, but that of, um, and other things come into play, including hands and objects. I think this is profoundly important because our visual system we know at every level, from the lowest levels, V1, V2, V3, all the way up to those levels involved in object recognition, we know they are tuned continuously by the nature of the visual experience. So this information about faces that, is, that are close and dominant in view is not just driving face recognition in the visual system, it's driving everything. It's playing a role in the tuning of every part of the visual system. What does it mean to have a visual system that is trained first with a lot of faces close up and then is trained in a variety of other kinds of experiences? We don't know the answer to that, but I think it's one that we need to know the answer to. Another question we need to know the answer to is how much of what I have presented about the visual experiences of young babies and how it changes over the first year of life. How much of that is about babies in Bloomington, Indiana versus other babies in the world? To get a, a beginning glance at this issue, we've gone um, to uh, Mumbai, India. And we, in that work, we're collecting data from infants who live in um, very poor settlements where there is not electricity where the houses are all very close together, a lot of cooking in the street, a lot of communal living. And what we find, there are differences that I think might be potentially very, very important. Um, so if we look at uh, the babies in Mumbai, India, what we find is there's no um, age-related decline in the number of faces that are in view, although this is very systematic in Bloomington, it is not in India. There are lots of faces in view, and it's highly variable. There are sometimes 20 people in the street and sometimes just your mom. It's also the case that the babies in um, India, in this group in uh, Mumbai, 
that they see many more different people. The three most frequent people in their lives do not account for 100% of the faces that they see. But what is constant and what may be the critical sort of essential part of the human face experience is very similar developmental trajectories in the frequency of close faces. What these close faces are doing in both cultures is engaging in face-to-face -face play um, with the infant. And we have new data that will come out showing that this is very sustained face-to-face -to -face play and that this is what is very constant and making up those 15 minutes out of every hour for those babies in the early days. All right. So there's a great deal that we don't know about it, all this, and we need much, much more data, and we need much, much more theory about what it may mean for the developing system. But I also want to go to the next part of the talk now for an understanding what, in having what it means to have a theory of developing environments. We just can't be at the big scale, moving from faces to hands on objects. We also have to think of what is happening at the more rapid, real-time scale in which infants interact with their worlds. And so to understand that, what I'm going to do right now is zoom in um, on one period of development and think about what's happening at fractions of a second. And I'm going to go to that period in which um, hands start dominating and what the role of that is in the learning of object names. So now we're moving to the real time how the moment-to-moment -moment experiences drive change and learning. And I'm going to move uh, to data that comes from what we call the multi-sensory project. And this is a project in which Chen Yu plays um, really the lead role, my collaborator. And in these studies, what we do is we have either dual head cameras or in the more recent work, uh, dual head-mounted eye trackers on the mother and the infant. We have motion sensors on heads, hands, and eyes, because we have eye trackers. We record audio, um, and we what we do in these tasks is we have parents come in and they play with their children um, with novel objects. And we've collected data on infants from 9 to um, 36 months of age. And let me just show you a little movie here of what this is like. OK. So um, the mom's view, so you can see the head camera image and then the uh, crosshairs show gaze within that image. The mom's view has the baby in view and then the baby's view has the objects in view, pretty much. All right. Uh, moving on here. All right. So what we do with this work is we go in and we try to understand um, what the properties of visual experiences and motion experiences and social experiences are at a very fine temporal scale, at fractions of a second. And one of the things that we discovered early was the special role of hands that fits in with the findings that we're getting from the at-home corpus of egocentric views. For the infant between 12 and 24 months of age, objects come in and out of view rapidly. And often there is one object much, much larger in the view than others so this is a standard kind of result. This is one infant's data in real time. On the y-axis is the percentage of pixels taken up by the red object, the blue object, or the green object. And time in seconds is on the uh, y-axis, on the x-axis. And what you can see is that objects are occasionally huge, taking up the uh, whole image dominating the scene. And what we also know from these studies is that parents often, each one of these yellow lines is a naming moment. Parents often name objects at moments at which one object is visually large in the infant's view. We also know that these results do not characterize just this pristine lab context. We've now replicated it in cluttered, in um, cluttered contexts of, at, of the home or in contexts in which there are over 30 objects on the floor. So this one is from a, a study in which there were 30 objects on the floor. It's again up there, the blue bar, that is one, the blue graph, it is one dyad. Um, 
It is the visual size of the baby doll in the uh, infant's view as a function of time in seconds. And shown there in the little bars below are when the parent or child touched the object and when the parent named object. And once again, parents are much more likely, although not always, to name the object when it is visually large and dominant in the child's view. So just to recap that, at this period in development when infants are handling objects, Objects are often large and close in the infant's view. And that's often when they're named by parents, so it seems a very reasonable question to ask, is this an optimal moment for learning object names? And so we went after that question in um, two studies. Um, and what we did in these studies is we had uh, parents, again, play with objects with their children while they both wore um, head-mounted cameras. And the objects that they played with were novel, and we taught the parent ahead the names of those novel objects. The parent was not told to teach the child the object names, and the parent was not told that the child was going to be tested after play as to whether they had learned those object names. But then we tested the child after play in a three alternative force choice task as to whether they remembered the names of those objects that they had played with with their parent. And then here's what we do. So we go in and we've measured what the, the child's performance in the word learning task. And we measure them twice on each object and object name. There were six of them across the experiment. And what we're going to do is we're going to say if the, child has, if the child chooses the named object two out of two times, they're tested twice on each object, in this force alternative choice task, we're going to say the child learned that object name. If they don't do it two out of two times, we're going to say the child did not learn that object name. Then we go back in and we look at what has happened in the play session around those naming moments and particularly what the visual properties were in the head camera scene. Okay? Now, you may be thinking, and you'd be quite right to think this, that okay, two out of two, that the child got it right two out of two times, that hardly means they learned it, okay? That's still within the, by the binomial, could be 0.10 chance, right, that they're getting it right. Um, and also, you might be thinking, well, geez, you know, the mom might have named that Modi object, um, or I guess we don't have Moby there, the Doty object, five times, and only maybe one of them was a high-quality naming moment, and that one high-quality naming moment was when they learned the object name, but you're throwing in all the other four naming events, which might have not been so good, okay? The point is, that's noise. All that is noise, right? And so if I can find the signal that distinguishes learned, learned, from unlearned object names, despite that noise, then we will have something to talk about, and I'm telling you this because we have something to talk about. Um, so these are actually the results that Alfredo Pereira, who was the first author in the study and is in the room, um, did. And let me uh, usually walk over here. All right, let me try my little laser pointer for the first time. Ah, so down, what we have here is these graphs concern the moments in which the child learned. These graphs concern the trials in which we categorize the child as not learning. Down here, in the middle, is the word at. That is the moment in which the, child, at which the parent named the object for the child during play. And we are going to look at visual properties 10 seconds prior to that naming event and 10 seconds after that naming event. That's a very long time, 20 seconds around the naming event. Okay. All right, up here, this is the measure of the visual size of the object in terms of percentage of pixels. And what you can, the blue line is for the object that was named by the parent, and the red is for the competitor objects. And what you can see is that in terms of visual size, for the object names that the child looked like they learned at our test, the named object was much, much larger during the naming moment than the competitor objects but that this is not so true for the object names that the child did not learn. Here we are showing the distance of the objects um, 
Actually, we're showing how centered the objects are, the inverse of the distance from the center. And what you can see is that the, for the object names the child learned, the name target was more centered in the visual, in the head camera image than were the competitors. And that this advantage was not so great for the unlearned object names. And the other thing to notice about this is that these are enduring phenomena. It is not like a second that the, there is a visual advantage for the name target over the competitors that's associated with learning. It endures over periods of four to five seconds around the naming moment. So infants learn object names, toddlers learn object names when the referent is visually salient, bigger in the view, more centered than the competitors. And when it is bigger and more centered for an enduring period of time before and after naming. Now this is a direct consequence. These properties of high quality naming moments, it's a direct consequence of how toddlers' bodies work. Okay? And we actually know a fair bit about that. These naming moments in which there is an object much larger than other objects, those coincide with moments in which the child is holding the object, and it coincides in moments in which the child's head is stable. Okay? Babies move their heads a lot, but when they, these optimal naming moments coincide with moments in which they are holding the object and the head is stable. Now, you might look here, okay? And you might say to yourself, well, is it really the baby holding the object or is it the visual signal that matters? That's a very hard question to answer, but it is the case that learning is more associated with the baby holding the object than with the parent creating the same visual scene. Why it's a hard question to answer is that we know that stability, head stability also matters, and that head stability is controlled by the baby holding the object. We also know that um, it is associated with the more stable head, with greater head and eye alignment. Okay? What all this means okay, is that in the toddler, in babies older than 12 months, visual attention and learning involves the whole sensory motor system. It emerges in the real-time coupling and self-organization of head, eyes, and hands. And so at this point, learning object names is about the coordinated focus of eye, head, and hands, and the stabilized visual attention that brings about, and the reduction of visual competition that holding an object close brings about. The point I'd like to suggest is this is a particular moment in developmental time, toddler time, in which the baby's body works this way. Three-year-olds' bodies don't work like that. They do not attend by bringing their head close to objects. They attend more like we do, okay? By refocusing and by internal control. But this way that toddlers attend, by bringing objects close and holding them, using their hands, may be a particularly relevant factor that underlies the rapid learning of object names that happens after the first birthday. To move to the idea of developmental niches, the next thing I want to tell you is that this, these facts about how 18-month-olds use their bodies to selectively attend to objects and how this matters to object name learning, this is not true of younger infants. So recently we have been looking on 8 to 10-month-olds. This is a period of time that is traditionally ahead of the start of word learning, although now we know from studies by David Swingley and others that babies do have some initial understanding of object names prior to, or during this time. But mostly, what you think of when you think of eight to 10 month olds as a developmental psychologist is you think about babies who are working on sitting stably, who are trying to figure out object manipulation, who really want to be able to stand and they're not good at any of this. This is the age of babies who, when they reach for objects, topple over, okay? Or when they try to pick up an object, can't quite get it held, okay, and drop it. 
And now I'm going to go back to um, data from the Home View project. And what we have done um, in two recent studies is we've looked at the visual frequency of objects in scenes for eight to ten month olds. This is in their home and from data collected over four to six hours in the home from each child. And what we have found is that the visual frequency of objects and scenes at eight to ten months, but not the frequency of words in parent speech, predicts age of acquisition. So what we did in these studies is we collected, um, pulled from the corpus of home view egocentric scenes, uh, all the scenes that were associated with meal times. Now, why did we choose meal times? Because we wanted some event that could characterize younger as well as older children. We wanted some event that occurred in every child's life and some event that occurred lots of times in a day. These mealtime events occur about five times a day for each child. And we defined mealtimes events very, very broadly in terms of any context in which anybody was eating. Okay, or doing something with food. So you don't really want to think of these mealtime images as a baby sitting in a high chair being fed. They include being on the floor with Cheerios. They include um, running around. They include all kinds of things. Not quite running around, but being on the floor, moving around with food. All right. All right. So. All right. So what we do to analyze the contents of these scenes is um, we had about 500 naive adults, these are people on Amazon Turk, tell us what they saw as the objects in the scene. Their task was to name the five most obvious objects in the scene and to use basic level nouns to do so. They were taught what a basic level noun was. Um, coders saw images in sequential sets of 20 and each coder was asked to tell us five objects in a scene, and each scene was coded by four individuals, giving us potentially 20 objects in each scene if they all said different objects. And what we found was that these scenes for eight to 10 month olds, unlike perhaps the scenes for 18 month olds, are highly, highly cluttered scenes. These scenes look like what developmental psychologists have said word learning looks like right from the beginning. Lots of uncertainties. The Turkers provided us with 745 unique object categories um, in these corpuses of 8,000 in the first study and 30,000 in the second study scenes. And there were on average, by the Turkers, maximum of 20, um, nine objects about nine objects in each scene, basic level categories. Of these 500 unique object labels provided of the, by the Turkers, we partitioned them into when the labels for these object categories are normatively learned by uh, children learning American English. So we classified the nouns as either first nouns if, those are, if they were labels, the labels provided by the Turkers, if they were nouns that were normatively learned before infants were 16 months of age. We called them early nouns if the labels were nouns that were normatively learned after 16 months but before 30 months. And we called them later nouns if they were any other noun. And those nouns were, um, had an average age of acquisition of six years, so they were not obscure nouns, they were common nouns. And here's what I want to show you, okay? This is in the first study in which we had 8,000 scenes that we measured. Second study had 30,000. This one had 8,000. And what you can see is that the frequency distribution of objects in these scenes is not uniform. It is not normal, okay? Instead, there are very few scenes that are very, very frequent showing up in 8,000, 6,000, 4,000 of the scenes. But most objects provided, object labels provided by the Turkers occurred rarely. Once, twice. Okay. Moreover, those objects that were highly frequent, that were pervasively present in these scenes, those are the pink ones in this image, they corresponded to object categories for which infants learn the object names early, normatively prior to 
16 months. This just is another representation of the same data. And I just provide it to show you the top 15 first nouns, early nouns, and later nouns, so that you can see that there's nothing. The later nouns and the early nouns are common things in people's houses. They're just not common in, front of, in a pervasive way in front of these babies' eyes. All right, so this is the study we did with, um, the first study we did. Then we went in, and you might ask yourself, well, why are those super prevalent objects, why do they correspond to the object names that children learn first? Any reasonable person would say, those objects that are pervasively in front of infants' faces, those have got to be the objects parents are talking about to their infants, right? So they have lots and lots of data on word object co-occurrences for these privileged, highly pervasive objects. But that is not the case, OK? Now I'm going to have to explain this next graph, OK? On the y-axis is the, this is from our study with 30,000 things. And on the y-axis is the frequency of individual object categories ordered from the most frequent to the least frequent in these images. But you will see that it tops out at 200. That's because it actually goes all the way up there. But if I do that, you can't see the words for those objects, OK? So I just cut it off at 200. But it's going all the way up there to about 25,000 for the most frequent objects in these scenes. Because what I want you to see is the most frequent object, the frequency of its name in parent speech to children during these episodes, OK? Parents are not talking about these high frequency objects at 8 to 10 month olds. There is no relationship between the frequency of these early learned object names in the visual scenes and the frequency in parent speech when those objects are in view of the child. And you might be thinking, how can that be? If you're a developmental psychologist who spent any time with parents and with 8 to 10 month olds, it makes sense to you. Babies this age do not talk. They are generally considered to be pre-linguistic. Parents are not naming objects to them over and over again like you do to a child greater than 12 months of age. When you listen to these tapes of what words that are being said during these mealtime episodes, they are things like, hi, sweetie, honey, could you put the dog out, OK? They, have, they are not naming objects. They are talking, family talk, OK? They are not naming these objects. So what these results tell us is that the visual frequency of objects prior to systematic naming predicts the normative age of acquisition of first learned object names. Here's what I think is going on. I think the visual learning side of, first, of object name learning, of learning first object names, is a very, very hard problem for babies to solve. And what they have to do first is learn to find objects and scenes and learn to recognize them in the real world, which is not like we do it in the lab with pictures on a screen. They get to see the same object close, far, in cluttered, partially obscured, upside down, in different lighting conditions. And that what these pervasive visual experiences are is about teaching the visual system what, how to recognize an object and what an object is. So, there's a lot that's still open about these questions, but the idea is that the statistics and the visual objects and babies' visual scenes are going to be a big player in learning early object names. But let's come back to the niche idea. For my 8 to 10 month olds, their world is like this. It's cluttered and a mess, OK? For 18 month olds, it's much cleaner. They're holding objects in their hands, and they're bringing them into view. So for 8 to 10 month olds, we have a few high frequency objects, like the sippy cup that's in every one of those images. But it's in clutter. Most other objects that are part of that clutter, though, are rarer. They show up only occasionally. 
but the sippy cup shows up all the time. And during this time, they have few herd object names. And what I'm suggesting is this is a time of incremental statistical learning about the visual world and about visual objects. By 18 months, we have a different species here. We have a different kind of learner. This is a child who actively creates information about objects, pulling an object forward, making it big in its view and sustaining attention on it. That invites parents to name that object for them. And they may have much more in the moment or more rapid forms of learning object names, a different kind of learner. So what we have here is kind of different niches, one designed for perhaps incremental statistical learning about visual objects, and one designed for the rapid learning of object names. So the pervasiveness of unnamed objects in the early learned scenes, to summarize, come to an end here, um, predicts first words. But scene structure and their dynamics change markedly as infants grow and develop more sensory motor skills. Those skills, trunk control, eye-hand coordination, yield more sophisticated hand actions that isolate objects within scenes and invite parent naming. And all this is likely, as I said at the beginning, important beyond object name learning. Does the fact that faces are dense early in visual learning matter in terms of how the visual system is trained? And what does it mean if we were to understand the computational properties at low-level statistics as well as high-level statistics of the kinds of face scenes these babies see for recognizing and tuning the visual system as a whole? So what babies do, the what I would like to conclude is that the environment develops. The environment develops because it's created in part by the developing infant. Because development also brings the accomplishments of the past forward, new learning environments and the new dynamics are created by past learning. So what happened earlier will happen what, shaped what happens later. And all of this, the developing child themselves, plays a big role in determining the structure of the learning environment. So. Here's what I've told you. I've told you that developing environments are shaped, that envir the environment for learning is shaped by the child's own behavior, by what they can do, and that this means that environments are ordered, different kinds of visual experiences at different points in development. These may vary across culture, but they also may be deeply constrained. And what we need is a theory of these changing environments that asks us, what are we accomplishing by having different statistics at different points in time. If you think computationally, really what the developing sensory motor system is doing for the child is it is taking their hand and walking them through a search space. They don't have to, they're not wandering around everywhere about all the tasks they have to solve. They're being walked through systematically in a particular order. And I think what we need to understand is why and how that order matters. All right, so now I am at the end, just at the point at which I should be. All right, and um, first of all, I want to thank all the people who are involved um, in these projects and, of course, um, the financial support for them. All right, thank you.